Konnichiwa. My name is Kate Stewart, and I've been focusing on how we can make embedded system dependable here at the Linux Foundation. One of the projects I spend a lot of my time with is Zephyr, and I'd like to share a bit about what we're starting to see as smart devices are starting to emerge with Zephyr now incorporated. Oops. There we go. So, open question, where is MI and ML being used? Um, the artificial intelligence machine learning, mostly we're hearing about it up on those servers, okay? All the language models, everything else that's going on there. But people are also working it on their own workstations, on their laptops and desktops and um, Chromebook, you know, books and so forth. But we also see places where you can download apps, like the information appliances, like your TV, like your phone, like your watch. There are small models running on those now. And you also get some of them starting to head towards um, some of the embedded computers for doing uh, some processing before things get communicated outwards. And so machine learning is showing up in some fashion on all of these, and they're all sort of interacting to get the data and do the processing. Now, we know that Linux is on most of these computers. It goes to somewhat it doesn't go all the way on the embedded side, <laughs> but it certainly goes way up into the servers. And Zephyr is um, being, we're seeing it now starting to show up on those information appliances and the deeply embedded computers. Um, but we also start to see it as well in the firmware for like the workstations and the servers. So when those devices are not doing anything and they're powering down, um, we know that Zephyr is being used in some of these firmwares for just monitoring the devices to figure out when it should wake up again. But it uses a lot less power, and this all helps with the overall performance of these devices, too. So Zephyr's got a role to play um, throughout the spectrum. But the heart of it really is going to be in these smart devices. And it's been fun. It really has been a lot of fun. Um, trying to learn where Zephyr is hiding <laughs> in the ecosystem today. Um, we can get, you know, some of, um, some of the companies will tell us, and others of them we go and read their data sheets to find this out. <laughs> um, basically, like the Moto Watch is running Zephyr right now, their smartwatch. Um, Samsung's Galaxy Ring, we looked at the fact sheet and it's running Zephyr. Um, and then Benjamin just told me last week about the fact that the World Orb Iris Scanner for identity recognition is running Zephyr now. Um, there's dog, like your dog and cat trackers. Um, as you, your pet walks around the neighborhood, you can know where they are on your phone. That's got Zephyr, as does it for livestock, for sheep and you know, goats and so forth. Um, so you know, the tracking sort of solutions are there. And then in the embedded, real you know, hard embedded site, there's something like the RAM 1 which is installed in the um, high, high power electric grids for monitoring the line and the conductivity. And that has to last for five years in the field on one battery charge. So it has to be pretty smart about how it's doing things. Um, there's a waste management system. Um, that one is sitting there and looking at uh, image recognition on the contents inside a garbage can. Not your most exciting subject, but on the other hand, if the trash can isn't full, they don't dispatch a truck to empty it. So it's saving resources. Similarly, this best pump monitoring is being used to analyze the flow out of a wastewater tank of a train <laughs> to make sure that it gets emptied properly and so the toilets on the train still work, which I think we'll all agree is important when we're taking trains for four hours. So it's being found in places that you know just make life a little bit better for everyone um, and have to be efficient. But all these products are emerging really rapidly right now. And they're using AI and ML either on the device or with the, an AI and ML device on a server to save time, money, power, and other resources. So for those who are not familiar with Zephyr Project, um, we started in 2016 and it's been growing very rapidly. Um, it's, there's over 100,000 commits in the repo at this point, and it's probably the fourth most active project at the Linux Foundation today, with about uh, 2.8 commits per hour going on right now. Um, and why is it getting so popular? Well, it's taken a lot of lessons from Linux. It's not Linux, but it has taken lessons from Linux, and quite frankly, it's making it very easy um, for smart device developers to just focus on their application and put the pieces they want together in place. 
So let's start looking at what the requirements would be to support a smart device out in the field. Well, you might want to have connectivity, because IoT, you have to talk to something usually. Um, you may want to have support a wide range of hardware. So you have some supply chain independence. You want to have some options for working with your AI and ML modules and models creation and training. You may want to have some sort of graphical interface on some of the, you know, the intelligent appliances. Um, and you may want to have, make sure you can get the smallest memory footprint because that takes resources and power. And then obviously we want these things to be secure. They're sending data, some of it's sensitive, some of it's not so sensitive. But when it is sensitive, we want to make sure we have a trusted path here. So let's take these one by one. So obviously the key for IoTVD is, IoT is connectivity. And there are a lot of ways to communicate out there. Oops. Hello? There. So we start with an IP stack. From the beginning of its existence, Zephyr's had its own IP stack. And we've been continually working to refine its quality and performance. And most of the high-level protocols are already integrated, as are the technologies they run on. Um, from the Bluetooth, we've got leading edge Bluetooth support. Um, the Bluetooth SIG is using our stack to demonstrate how mesh works. And we're also officially qualified for the LEN and mesh support. Uh, Bluetooth community in Zephyr is actually very active. And so when there's any new major evolutions in the Bluetooth standards, they're usually there prototyping and participating in advance. And so as soon as things are public, they, they show up on Zephyr. Then um, we also have a rather complete USB stack, including USB-C and WebUSB. And so the USB connectivity is available to you to just build from. So I think you can kind of say that we do have our connectivity options covered with this project right now. Let's look at hardware. Come on, talk to me. There we go. All major architectures that are common right now are being supported on Zephyr. A cores, R cores, M cores, 32-bit, 64-bit, variants of RISC-V, variants of x86. Uh, you can find them on ARM, as well as some of the historical ones have been ported over to Zephyr, I should say. And so mostly, these are the heart of what the industry is. And there's over 220 sensors sitting there that you can config in and just start using. Um, in fact, on the sensors page, um, we basically doubled in the last two years the number of sensors that were supported. So people are contributing, and that's part of that velocity I was telling you about. And this is resulting in like something like 700 boards out there. So if you go into the Zephyr repo, you're going to see this. Um, it's there, and chances are, if you have board handy or something like that, you probably find a Zephyr port to play with. And that makes it easy for developers to pick things up and start quickly. So let's talk about AI and ML models. Okay. We've got TensorFlow Lite. Um, it's been around for, and working with Zephyr for the last couple of years now. And we actually have integrated examples of how to use it with Zephyr sitting in our repo and our documentation repo. And there's a blog if you want to read more about it. And the links to these slides will have that information. And there's actually three ML apps in our repo already. Um, and the Reno simulator um, has basically does a build of all of our samples across all of our hardware platforms to test their simulator. And they make the results publicly available, which is really good. But you know, there's a TensorFlow Lite Micro, a Kenning TensorFlow Lite Micro, and a Kenning Micro TBM version up there for you to start with and just play with on the simulator or on a board. And the images for there or the board to download. The TBM framework is available, and Micro TBM, I should say, and Edge Impulse's framework is also available and working with Zephyr. And so you can sort of read their documentation on how to work with it. So I think you can see we've got the ML, AI and ML module integration starting now. And what about graphics? Well, we kind of need graphics for those information appliances. And LVGL is already natively integrated into the project. Um, and so it can run a desktop environment as well as um, to help speed up the development. Come on, talk to me. There we go. And as of uh, last month, we have two new members in the Zephyr project, MicroEdge and the QT group, both of which specialize in graphical interfaces. And so I think you'll be seeing more options emerging and more products emerging with these interfaces on Zephyr in the years to come. Um, OK, memory footprint. It's got to be small at that edge, so you don't want to use a lot of power. So you want your 
image to be as small as possible. Well, we took a lesson here from the Linux kernel. We're using device tree and we're using kconfig. So you basically have your, your hardware parameterized and you just config into the final image exactly what you need. And this basically saves space. So I think we're good there. Okay, power. Well, <laughs> power management is also already integrated. So, um, you know, for devices that have to last in the field for five years, like that RAM one I was telling you about earlier, um, Zephyr, you know, was a good solution for them when they were looking for options. Because uh, they could have that much fine grained control. And now, okay, security is key for everyone. So, we want to make it easy for product developers. We have a vulnerability alert registry system. We also automatically generate S bombs on builds for all. Uh, for the Zephyr sources and your app sources. So if you have to comply with something like the European CRA or some of the work going on, you can get SPD, SPDXS bombs automatically anytime you do a build without doing extra work. And literally, those three lines are all it takes, okay? It's that simple if you're working with the West build system out of SPDX. And if you actually go on that Reno dashboard I was telling you about a few minutes ago, Every image on there that says built, passed, or generated has those three S-bombs in there. So we can do this at scale. And we have been doing it for several years now. And we are continuing to evaluate, uh, you know, we've basically got it working with SPDX 2.2, 2.3, and we're moving over to 3.0. So security is a journey. It's not, an, you know, it's not a point in time. And every time the project is seeing a better best practice, we're continuing to evolve and enhance it. So I think with that, you can sort of see we're catching most of the requirements with this project for um, working for smart devices, which makes it easier for the developers to just focus on what they care about, which is their application and taking things to market. And I think we've got the story there. So the results are we're seeing people take existing examples and port them over, ML examples and port them to Zephyr, like a little um, tiny ML powered artificial nose. Um, Benjamin Kabe, who's our developer advocate in the project, um, basically, basically did the port on a flight um, for, before a conference. So he also does last minute slides like I do. And, but he also did the last minute implication too. Um, we also see a case study showing up um, by Goliath, which is one of our members, and Phlox on basically detecting animals and then warning them away when they're getting too close to humans to try to keep animals safe. Another. Um, place where we've seen Zephyr used is in implantables in rhino horns that have to last for two years in the field. And they basically use the signals and then machine learning to detect the movement patterns. And with this, they've actually caught poachers. So, you know, this is helping with the diversity of the planet and keeping things a little bit more useful. And we're also seeing lots and lots of new projects emerging. Crowd Supply just recently put up a page for us um, saying all the projects that they were seeing with Zephyr. And as you sort of see right in the center there, um, the Healthy Pi uh, move is being funded right now, and um, it's got its funding, and it's likely to probably have some ML added onto it when it shows up in the market, I suspect. So if you're interested to learn more about Zephyr, we have some sessions tomorrow that'll be relevant. Um, if you want to, specifically, if you're interested in learning more about all those security practices I sort of glossed over quickly, um, I'll be holding a deep dive on that and I'd welcome anyone who's interested to come and talk to me. And then if you are interested in meeting some of the Zephyr community here in Japan, um, Tokita-san from Fujitsu and Shoji-san from Space Cubics um, are going to be hosting a boff about Zephyr and there will be kites given away. So if you would like to get a Zephyr kite, we will have some in that room for you. So I hope to see some of you there. And with that, I will say, Thank you very much to the program committee for being interested in this topic and giving me the opportunity to share what we're seeing in this innovative market. Thank you again. Arigatou gozaimasu.